Is anybody happy this morning? Anybody out there happy, happy, happy? All right, just checking, just checking, just want to check, you know, you never know. I mean, we don't live, if you, if you think about it, I mean, does anybody live to be unhappy? Anybody live to be unhappy? No, I don't see any hands going up. Anybody live to be sad, you know, be sourpuss? Anybody live to be mad? And I'm just lifting up my hand. I'm not raising my hand to, because that's what I live for. I'm just asking you to raise your hand if that's what you live for. No, we don't do that, right? We, we live, we want to be happy each and every day of our lives. We want to have joy. We want to be glad. We want to enjoy life. We want all of those things in our lives. We don't live to be, again, unhappy and mad and, and just uh, uh, sad all the time or disappointed or discouraged and, and all of those things. We live to be happy. And so, uh, again, we're, we've been in this series called the Happy Series. We've been enjoying, enjoying the song. And I hope that every time you hear the song, every time you hear Farrell sing this song, I hope that you think of this series. And, in fact, uh, we are going to bring it to a close today. We're going to bring the, the series to a close uh, with part four. If you've missed any parts, if you miss any of these, any, uh, any part to this series, Go to our website, wiredalive.com slash media, and, uh, and you can watch or listen to, you can download, uh, check out those messages. If you've missed any, even if you've been here, I definitely encourage you to go back and, uh, and watch them, listen to them uh, again. I don't know about you, but I have, um, you know, I enjoy being able to, to share the message. I enjoy studying God's word and, and all of those things. Uh, but this has been one of those uh, particular series that I've just enjoyed a little bit more. I don't know if you've enjoyed this series. I have. So even if you have haven't. I've enjoyed sharing it, so uh, that's okay. If, if you haven't, that's all right. We'll, we'll come back with another series that maybe you'll like better than, uh, better than this one. But we've been on this series called Happy, and we've been talking about happiness, and we've been talking about aspects of happiness. And, and here's the thing is, if you want happiness where it's just temporal, where it's just, it's just moment by moment, where uh, you know one moment you're happy, and the next moment you're unhappy, and then another moment you're, you're happy, because we, we talked about this in week one, right, that there are some things that make us happy. There are some things, there are some places, some people, some foods that, you know, that we just enjoy, that make us really happy. And then there are some things that we don't enjoy joy too much, or there are some things in life that make us unhappy. But here's what we found over, over these last several weeks, is that true happiness is not a feeling or, or an emotion. True happiness encompass, encompasses feelings and emotions, but it's not, by its very definition and by its very design by God, it's not a feeling, it's not an emotion, and it's also not designed to just be experienced in one moment, and then maybe another moment down the road. But in between those moments of happiness are unhappy moments or discouraging moments or mad moments or frustrating moments or disappointing moments. But that actually true happiness helps us even in, and I think this is the, the biggest thing that we've probably talked about in this series aside from God giving us that true happiness, that true happiness is when we can still be not only happy, that we could be blessed, but it also, what we've also talked about is that even in the midst of the unhappiness, in the midst of the disappointment, and in the midst of the discouragement, that we could still be happy through those things because true happiness and what we found in, the, in this word is that it means to be calm. It means to be level. It means to be going forward. And so true happiness, in true happiness, we can experience true happiness and we can have that. We can, we can walk in that even in the midst of unhappy times times, even in the midst of discouraging times. And, and what we've also found is that 
The only way that we could experience true happiness, the only way that we're going to enjoy true happiness is by going to the one that gives it himself, the one that created it himself, and that's God. We cannot experience true happiness in this life without God. And just like you've heard me say before, we could have a good life without God, we could have a great life without God, but we cannot experience the very best life that God has in store for us without him. Because he created it. He designed it. And same thing goes with happiness or true happiness. And the reason why I define it as true happiness is because we all know happiness. And and we all know what we've been taught or what we've learned or what we've experienced in our society, in our culture, in our world about what happiness is. But happiness to our culture is is just temporary. Again, happy one moment, and then I'm unhappy the the next moment. Now, I want to kind of bring a close to this series with um we again we've talked about things that make us happy and and even as we look at the the we've looked at the scripture over the last couple weeks and talked about things that uh that will continue to to make us happy or, or things that really will will make us happy one most important thing being that relationship with god but what about those things that make us unhappy like what about those things that we're not too we're not too glad about it. We're not too fond of, and we don't enjoy. Like, what about those things that don't make us all that happy? Like, like our outlaws. I mean, in-laws. You know, like those those people. Now, I, I do gotta. I, I do gotta. I want to make sure I say this because my mother-in-law is in here. I have, and I'm not just saying this. I truly do have really good in-laws. I have some, I mean, I've heard some horror stories and I've got some good in-laws, but sometimes, you know, like for, for some of us, it might be like, man, you know, my, my in-laws, my outlaws, man, they just, they just make me unhappy. Or, or maybe there's that certain food that you just, you just don't like. You don't want to be around it. You don't want to smell it. It makes you unhappy. Maybe it's stupid drivers, right? <laughs> Anybody experience a, a stupid driver this week? I experienced one. We were coming home from the gym, and, um, and I don't know how many feet. I, I want to say that maybe uh, my truck is here to maybe like the third row um, here on the upper uh, part of the seats there. And, and we're just coming home. And this lady, I'm watching her the whole time. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've learned over the last 10, 15 years You have to drive defensively no matter what. You just have to, I don't care if you're on a motorcycle or you're in an automobile, you have to drive defensively no matter what. Well, I see this lady, she's going to come into the median. I'm on Santa Barbara. She's going to come into the the median. And I'm just like, man, and I know it's the spirit of God just saying, watch this lady, watch this lady. Because this lady, the distance that I'm telling you, the third row, here's where my truck is. Uh, this lady pulls out and, and she doesn't like gun it, guns it to get to the median. No, she just kind of takes her time. And no joke, if I, did, if I wasn't already being defensive, I'm not, I'm not playing at all. I'm not, I'm not kidding at all. I would have plowed into her, possibly would have killed her. Because it would have just, my truck would have just mangled her little pickup truck because my truck's the beast. But my truck would have just mangled her pickup truck you know, and in some ways, my flesh, you know, afterwards, if that truly happened, and if I was okay, and Christine was okay, I, I might have gotten out of my truck and said, see, you, you deserve that. See, you got what you deserve. You know, thankfully, it, that didn't happen. I was able to break. We were able to get on the, on the side. But this lady, I mean, she was so clueless, and, and she wasn't even a blonde. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> she was clueless, though. The fact of the matter is, is there are just some people that just, you know, they make us unhappy. There are some things that make us unhappy, you know. There are some things that you think of that make us unhappy. But even in those situations and even in those circumstances, like that didn't ruin my day. That didn't tear up my evening. I didn't ignore my wife for the rest of the evening because of what this lady did or whatever. I wasn't mad. I wasn't, because I've learned. And, and, and it's not that, I've, that I'm perfect at it. I'm, I've learned and I'm learning that true happiness will get me through even in even the unhappy times and even the times that things are going, aren't going all that great, aren't going all that good, that I don't like and being around certain people or whatever it might be. And so there's probably some things that you think of that you're just like, man, these things just, these things just make me unhappy. I want to actually close this series out with a couple things 
that make us unhappy. I can, I can pretty much guarantee makes all of us unhappy. Talk about a couple things that make us unhappy. And the reason why I want to end off the series with this is because we can, even in these two things, and these are pretty big things, that even in these two things, we can find happiness, that we can experience true happiness even in the midst of these very things in our lives. And so, like, one of those things that I think of is, like, what about injustice? I mean, like, who likes injustice? You know, when you see injustice going on in our city or going on in our nation, and especially going on around the world, when you see people being mistreated, you know, when, when you see that there are, you hear the stories, these horror stories of sex trafficking, or, or you hear these horror stories of, of young boys being forced, taken away from their families and being forced to serve in, in an army, you know, to, to actually even fight against their family and, and, and their group of people. When you hear those horror stories, I mean, there's just something, I don't know about you, but there's just something that rises up inside me and say, no, man, that's wrong. You know, why are we doing this? Why is this happening? You know, there's something about that that aggravates me and, and probably aggravates you. That when we see this injustice, when we see Christians are being killed around the world for no reason but because they're Christian. You know, and even aside from Christians being killed, because listen, folks, it's not just Christians. There are other religions and there are other people that are being killed for no other reason than, hey, we're bigger, we're better, we're stronger than you, and so we're going to take you out. And I don't know about you, but I, but I hate that. That's something that bothers me. That's something that, that, that drives me nuts. That's something that's just like, you know, that's just injustice. That's just unfair. And that makes me unhappy, and it probably makes you unhappy too. Or when you hear these stories about kids that are being teased and being bullied, and, and you hear the horror stories of some of those kids that have been teased for years or years or, or throughout the school year, and they take their life. And I don't know about you, but that bothers me. Like, I don't like that. That doesn't make me happy. I'm disappointed in, 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 in kids that would do that to other kids, teenagers that would do that to other teenagers, people, adults that would do that to other adults. You know, those things, that injustice, that unfairness. I mean, it bothers it bothers us, don't it? I mean, it, it, it bothers us when, when we go to work and, and all we're hearing is, a, is a, the constant bickering or the gossiping of other people in, in, at work. And I don't know about you, but that's, that's just like bothersome. I mean, doesn't that bother you? I mean, doesn't that frustrate you? Doesn't that make you unhappy? There are things like injustice, unfairness, um, you know, that, that make us unhappy. So, so what do we do with that? Like, what do we do when we, when we see injustice? What do we do when we see people being mistreated, people being used and abused? What do we do when, when people are being treated unfairly, when there's a certain race that's being treated unfairly? What, what do we do with that? How, how, do we, how do we go about handling that? Because I know it, uh, initially, again, it doesn't make us happy. But what do we do with that unhappiness? And how do we be happy? How do we continue to walk in this true happiness that we've been talking about? How do we continue to walk in that in the midst of injustice? Something that aggravates us. Somebody, something that makes us perturbed and frustrated and angry. What do we do with that? Well, I want to go back to Psalms. We've been reading some of these verses. And again, I encourage you to go throughout Psalms. Look at where Jesus said it over and over, where he says, blessed is the person. Or David constantly was writing it in Psalms. Blessed is the person. Blessed is the one. And I want to look at a writer. We're not sure exactly who wrote this Psalm. It doesn't, it doesn't say. But I want to look at the writer of Psalm 106, verse 3. I want you to notice what he says. Again, the word blessed. He says, blessed are those. Blessed happy, calm, stable, going forward. That's what this word blessed means, right? True happiness. Blessed are those who defend justice and do what is right at all times. So the writer of this psalm, he's saying, you know, blessed are those that stand up for justice, that stand up for what is right. Now, when we read that, right, I mean, come on, let's, let's, let's be honest. When we read that, we say, we read, blessed are those who defend justice. All right, yeah, I'm going to defend justice. And when we read that, we think justice means retaliation, right? I mean, come on, let's be honest. 
We think if somebody's being mistreated or if I'm being mistreated or one of my friends are being mistreated or somebody's being abused in some way or somebody's being bullied or teased or somebody's being treated unfairly, the immediate thing that we think of is I'm going to get revenge on that person. I'm going to retaliate. I'm going to get my payback. And that's not what the psalmist is writing here. Because notice what he writes after that, right? He says, blessed are those who defend justice. Yes, let's defend justice. Let's stand up for what's right. But notice what else he says. He says, and does what is right at all times. See, it's not, it's not okay. It really isn't okay just because we're unhappy with injustice. It's really not okay to just take matters into our own hands. I mean, we've seen kind of a, a, an example of this in, in, the, uh, in the news here over the last several weeks or month or so, uh, where there was a situation where the cops, um, and I don't know the whole story, I don't have all the facts and, and, and all of that, but where the, the cops mistreated an individual and, uh, and the individual died, okay, the man died, and, and now, you know, people were, you know, just in an outrage, you know, and just in an outrage about this incident, about what took place, and, and they started tearing up their city. And it's like, you know, so, you know, yeah, maybe an injustice was done. I, I don't know. I don't know all the facts. I don't know the whole story. It looks like it to me. Maybe injustice was done. So what we do is we say, hey, an injustice was done, so that justifies my retaliation, right? Isn't that what we do? See, an injustice was done, so that justifies payback. Uh, injustice was done, so that justifies revenge. But friends, I want you to know that it doesn't. It doesn't justify revenge. It doesn't justify the retaliation. Retaliation, revenge, payback, whatever you want to call it, is wrong. And especially if we call ourselves Christians, it's absolutely wrong for us if we call ourselves children of God. In fact, Jesus actually said it this way. He said, if somebody slaps you in the face, turn the other side of your face to them. Now, Jesus wasn't saying, hey, be a doormat. Jesus wasn't saying, hey, let everybody walk all over you. Don't worry about it. You know, don't worry. About it. I mean, I know it's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. Just let everybody walk all over you. Because I'll tell you, Jesus wasn't a pushover. When you read about Jesus' life and you read about who he was and, and who he is, Jesus wasn't a pushover. And there were times where Jesus got in people's faces. And there were times where Jesus set aside, if you will, that humility. And he walked in that strength that he had. So Jesus wasn't saying, hey, you know, just be a pushover. Just let anybody use you, abuse you, do whatever they want to you. That's not what he was saying. But what he was saying is by turning the other cheek, he was saying, don't retaliate. Don't pay back what's been done to you. Don't give it in return. Just take it. Let's stand up for what's right. Let's stand up for what's good. You know, I remember many years ago, there was like this, and, uh, this whole thing of, of uh, abortion clinics that were being, that were being like blown up or, or uh, being uh, uh, sabotaged and, and destroyed and, and th those sorts of things. And, and come to find that there were some Christians that were behind it. And, and the thing is, is that we think that, well, because people are doing wrong, and, and Christians, here's... here's where our wrong thinking also comes in sometimes is that we think because people are doing wrong, people are doing bad, you know, doing something evil, doing something that doesn't line up with the word of God. And so we got to take judgment into our own hands. And so we go destroy stuff. We go destroy things like abortion clinics. Now, you know, I understand that, you know, according to the word of God, I know that every life is precious. And I know that that is, uh, that is a, a, a child that's, that's in there and all that. But that doesn't give us the right, Christians, to go around and start destroying people's property. It doesn't give us the right. It doesn't, it doesn't justify us being able to blow up abortion clinics just because it goes against our faith, just because it goes against our belief. See, there is a right way to go about the injustice that's happening in our world. There's a right way to go about the wrong that's happening in our world. Because here's what we do when we try to justify, especially if we call ourselves Christians, all right? What we're doing actually is we think that we're helping the situation, when in reality, we're making the situation a whole lot worse. Because the people look at us and they say, well, you're Christian? Aren't you supposed to love everybody? Where's the love in that? 
Where's the love in that retaliation? Where's the love in that revenge and that payback? Where is the love in that? Where is the love in blowing up that, that abortion clinic? Where is the love in that? There is no love at all. And we've got to be honest about that. See, I think this is a big issue. I think this is definitely something we should be perturbed about as far as uh, injustice and unfairness. But there is a right way to go about it, friends. There's a right way to deal with that injustice. And actually, look at it, look at it this way. You can't fight fire with fire. You fight it with water. I mean, that's just obvious, right? I mean, firemen, when they step on the scene and there's a fire, a massive fire, they don't say, hey, let's add fire to it. Now, I know sometimes they may burn a certain portion of land because the fire is, is jumping property and that sort of thing. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when they're coming to fight a fire, they don't say, all right, let's add more fire. That'll wipe it out. Let's add more fire to this burning building. That'll wipe it out. Let's add more fire to this burning house. That'll wipe it out. No, they don't do that. What do they do? They fight it with water. The only thing that's going to distinguish that fire is water. And here's what Paul says along those lines. Think about this. Because again, what we do is a lot of times is we see an injustice, an evil, a wrong that's done. And we say, okay, well, let's give injustice. Let's give evil. Let's, let's, do, let's, let's retaliate with the wrong and the evil. Because it justifies it, right? Well, Paul would disagree. The apostle Paul would disagree with us. Because he writes in Romans 12, 17, notice what Paul says. Don't pay people back with evil for the evil they do to you. Focus your thoughts on those things that are considered noble, those things that are considered right, those things that are considered good, those things that are considered, considered pure. Now, the interesting thing about this is, first off, again, notice what Paul says. He says, don't try to justify it. Don't try to make what's absolutely wrong Try to make it right. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make it right. Two wrongs. We've heard it all our lives. Two wrongs don't make it right. So somebody does me wrong, say, hey, I'm going to do them wrong. That's right. No, it's not. It's not right. And Paul says, don't pay people back with evil for the evil that they do. Notice the next word. Or actually, notice the next couple words. Focus your thoughts. See, Paul says, don't pay evil back. Focus your thoughts. Why did he have to say focus your thoughts? He says, don't pay back. An injustice has been done. I know you're mad. You're not happy. It's, it's rubbing you the wrong way, what that person did, what those people did. But he says, don't, don't pay back that evil, but focus your thoughts. Why did Paul have to say focus your thoughts? Because when we get unhappy, especially when injustice is going on, man, fists start to come up right? And there's like this incredible Hulk thing that's going on in, in us. I mean, ladies, you do it too. It's like, you know, you start changing, man. I'm telling you, man, incredible Hulk is real. We just don't turn green and big and all of that. But, but something starts happening, right? When injustice happens and anger rises up inside of you and you get mad, you're disappointed, and, and you're frustrated, and all of those emotions start revving up. And so Paul says, you got to focus your thoughts. Because if you don't focus your thoughts, guess what? You're going to start throwing fists. If you don't focus your thoughts, guess what? You're going to start giving somebody a piece of your mind. If you don't focus your thoughts, guess what? You're going to start doing some road rage action. If you don't focus your thoughts. And so Paul says first, he says, hey, don't pay back evil for evil. That's not the right way to go about injustice. That's not the right way to go about people that are doing something mean or, or, or uh, unruly or wrong to you. That's not the right way to go about it. But he says, focus your thoughts. The first thing that we got to do, if we're going to fight injustice, we got to focus our thoughts. We got to get our, our attitude in the right place because if we don't change our attitude, if we don't get our attitude in the right place, if we don't take control of this body, if we don't exercise self-control, this body will take over us. This mind will take over us. This mouth will take over us. And it'll start saying some things, thinking some things, doing some things that afterwards you and I will regret. We'll regret. We'll regret it. See, just because an injustice, is done, an injustice has been done, you know, we think that, and as Christians, we think that, oh, well, that, just, that gives us the right to be unruly. It doesn't. 
Again, Paul would disagree. So here's what else Paul writes. He says, okay, don't return evil for evil. Focus your thoughts. You've got to change that, change that attitude, change that behavior, or else you're going to do something, say something, think something that you're going to regret. And then drop down to verse 21. Notice what Paul continues to say. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil with good. And so there again, going back to the writer of that psalm, he says, hey, you know what? Blessed are those that defend justice and that do what is right at all times. They are blessed. They're, they're the ones that are actually, that are actually happy. Because really, when we, when we retaliate, yeah, maybe we get back in some way, and maybe that makes us feel good in some way. But it still doesn't solve the problem. It's still not the solution. The solution is actually when we conquer evil with good. When we love people no matter what, even though they don't, even though their lifestyle and, their, and what they say and how they live doesn't agree with the Bible, what we believe in, in our faith, even when that, when that is the case, we love people no matter what. Why? Because that is who our God is. God so loved the world, the world that was, that was just in, in sin and, and the world that was, that was just destructive and, and a world that, that hated God, a world that didn't want anything to do with God, a world that is just full of sin. God so loved it that he sent his son to die for the sins of the entire world. That while we were still sinners, Paul writes in another place, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not while we were good, but while we were bad, while we were evil, while we were mean, while we were unruly, Jesus Christ died for us. And in the same token, we got to take that very same love. Remember Jesus said, Two greatest commandments, all the law, all the prophets hang on it. Love God, love people. Love God, and that love that God exposes you to, you take that same love and you love people with it. Sure, we've got to stand up for what's right, absolutely. And we've got to stand up for what we believe in, but we don't have to be mean about it, friends. And we don't have to be judgmental about it. And we don't have to be, we definitely don't have to be, um, take revenge that's not who we are, especially, again, if we call ourselves Christians. Now, another thing that, uh, that I think of that when we think of what, we, what might make us unhappy, injustice being, being one of those things, then another thing that doesn't make us all that happy is hardship, right? I mean, come on, we can all agree with that. Challenges, like going through, through bad situations in life, I mean, we just, we do not like it. Like, we don't like when the AC goes out in our home, especially in Naples, Florida. How dare you, AC system, go out in Florida, all right? My AC went out a couple weeks ago, and, uh, and actually uh, last week uh, we had another issue with it, and, and it was blowing hot air. I'm like, oh, man, not again, you know. Thankfully, it was just frozen, just had to let it uh, melt, and, 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 you know, it was back on and, and good to go. But we don't like that. We don't like when our, when our automobile decides it's not going to start one morning, right? We don't like that. We, we don't like when it just decides. No, listen, automobile, you don't get to decide that. I decide whether you're going to start or not, okay? Whenever I come in here and whether I push the ignition button or I turn the key, you make sure you start. We don't like when the automobile decides whether it's going to start or not. We just don't like it. We don't like those situations. We don't like going through the challenges. We don't like going through the hardships. But friends, here's the thing is it's necessary. And if you're a Christian and somebody told you that after you become a Christian that your life is going to be perfect, you're never going to have to have any type of hardship, they lied to you, okay? Because Jesus said it point blank. He said it straight up. It was very encouraging. He said in this life, you're going to face hardship. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad about that. Man, I can't, I can't wait to face some hardship. See, we don't like when our relationships aren't firing on all cylinders. You know, it's, it's just not, we're not happy about that. When we're going through a, maybe a, a bit of a hardship or turmoil in our marriage or in our friendships, we don't, we don't like that. But here's the thing, friends, is the challenges of life are actually necessary. In fact, James, Jesus' brother, writes about this, and he talks about just the challenges and the hardships. Let's talk, of, talk about that. We'll close, we'll, we'll end off with this, uh, this last one as far as being unhappy. Notice this. James writes in James chapter 1, verse 2. He's writing to a group of people here, 
And he says this, blessed are those who endure. This word un- endure means to undergo. It means to, it means to persevere. It means to come under, right? So it means to undergo. It means to persevere. He says, blessed, again, there it is, happy, going forward, stable, calm. Blessed are those who undergo or persevere when they are tested. This word tested is, is exactly what you would think it, it, it means. Uh, it, it's, it's where something or someone is being proved by an experiment. So in other words, think of the challenges of life. The challenges of life are going to prove something about us. And it's going to prove something even to God about us. We'll get to that in, in just a second. But that's what's going on in this, in this word testing. This word test also means, uh, it means uh, like temptation. You know, so those that are going through a, a time of temptation or those that are going through adversity, all right? You're going through a hardship. If it's an adversity or if it's temptation, it encompasses all of those things. When we're tested in this life, whether it's hardship, whether it's adversity, whether it's some type of temptation, here's what James says. Blessed are those who endure. Now, I don't know about you, but James, I, I don't feel blessed by that. But James says we are, and, and, here's, and here's what he continues to say. Blessed are those who endure when they are tested. When they pass the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, he's, he's talking future terms in the sense of eternal life when Jesus Christ comes back and we, we are given eternal life, but he's also talking present terms as well. So he's saying, if we'll go through the hardship, if we'll go through the challenge, if we'll endure, if we'll persevere through it, and we'll pass the test that God has life for us. Again, going back to good, great, very best, that God has the very best, and that everything that he intended to bring about in your life and in my life, he's going to bring it about. But there are some challenges that we've got to go through. Why? Because we learn through the challenges, don't we? We learn through the situations. Now, sometimes we don't, and and sometimes we refuse it. And guess what? I'm just going to give you a tip here, all right? And I'm going to give a tip to myself as well. If we just resent all challenges, and we resent all hardships, and we have a bad attitude about it, and we don't want anything to do with it, guess what? God's going to cause us to walk around that mountain again. Because there's some things that we need to learn through the challenges. There's some things that we need to learn about ourselves. There's some, there's some changes that need to take place in our attitude, our behavior, our life, that God is not bringing those situations in our life. He doesn't bring the hardship in our life, but he'll use it. He'll use it to grow us up. Now, the interesting thing about this is James is writing this letter, and so he's dropping down. You know, we, we have chapter and verses uh, you know, that's how they, they broke it off and, uh, over time. But this was actually, you know, just one long letter, basically, to a group of people. And this is kind of, you know, somewhere down in this letter. But I want to go back to the beginning because I want, you to see, I want you to see something. All right, take, again, remember what James is saying here. Blessed are those that endure when they're, they're tested. When they pass the test, they receive life. God has life for them. Now, notice how James starts off this letter. He says, from James... Uh, Chapter 1, verse 1, from James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God's faithful people who have been scattered. Well, James, why have these people been scattered? What's going on? Well, if you know anything about this time, Christians at this time were facing some very severe persecution. And in fact, let me just stop there for just a second, because I can guarantee you that whatever hardships, whatever challenges, whatever temptations, whatever adversity that we face in this life will never be anything in comparison to what the early church faced when they were being persecuted, because they were being severely persecuted. They were being chased by the government, by the Roman government. They were being chased by the religious people. They were being chased, and they were being killed. If they weren't killed, they were being brutally punished and then thrown in prison. This is what was happening. In fact, the apostle Paul, he writes most of the New Testament, right? Some of those letters he wrote, actually probably like half of them, he wrote while he was in prison, He was arrested and thrown in prison for being a Christian. So, you know, let's put our, let's kind of put our suffering in perspective. And and let's put it even in perspective to what's going on around the world today. Because there are some people around the world and Christians around the world that are suffering severe persecution that makes our hardship, our little challenge, it makes it look like nothing. Honestly, it makes it look like nothing. 
But still, what do we do with the challenges? What do we do with the hardships that we're not all that thrilled about, that we're not all that happy about? Notice, uh, this is, this is, I mean, ah, this just gets me, this second sentence. Notice, to God's faithful people who are being severely persecuted, who are being killed, who are being tortured, who are being thrown in prison, yet they're faithful. I mean, what? They're faithful. That word faithful just simply means that they're full of faith or it means that they're full of trust in God. They're full of what they believe according to God's word. That they're full of that. You know, you hear about some people being full of it. Some people are full of it. And then there's some people that are full of faith. And you don't want to be full of it. And I don't want to be full of it. We want to be people that are full of faith. Because people that are full of faith work through the situations, get through and conquer and overcome adversity and temptation and the challenges and the hardship, hardships of life. But it's interesting because these people are being scattered. They're being severely persecuted. The last thing that you and I would think that James would say about them is that they were faithful. We would think that, oh man, these people have given up on God. We would think that, well, to these people that have given up on God, and, and I totally understand, James. You know, James says, I totally understand because you're being scattered, but he doesn't say that. He says, to these people that are full of faith, that are full of that trust in God, that no matter what, like Paul wrote, Paul wrote in, in, in one of his letters, he says, I am fully persuaded no matter what, Nothing is going to take me down. Paul said, nothing is going to trample over me. Nothing is going to overcome me. In fact, I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to overcome the adversity. I'm going to overcome the temptation. I'm going to overcome the hardship and the challenges of life, Paul said, because I have the creator of all things, and he's on my side. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world, than anything that's in this world. If God is for you, if God is for for, you, for me, what does it matter who's against us if we've got God on our side? And so notice now, notice this, because James says to God's faithful people who have been scattered, greetings, my brothers and sisters, be very happy, all right? He's got to tell them, be happy. I know, going through stuff, but be happy. You're blessed. Be calm. You're going forward. You're going to make it through this thing. He says, be very happy when you are tested in different ways. You know that such testing of your faith produces endurance. This word endurance is also patience, or it's also cheerful endurance. And that's the last thing we want, right? We don't want to be cheerful through something that is a hardship or a challenge. But James writes, and he says, cheerfully endure, persevere, undergo it. Because the testing of your faith, it produces that patience, right? And he goes on, he says, endure until your testing is over. Then you will be mature and complete and you won't need anything. Now notice that. Because again, here's the reality. God will use the situations, the challenges, the hardships of life. He'll use those things to grow us up in certain areas that we need to grow up in. He'll use those things to change us in some areas that we need to change in. But the other aspect of it is this, is that when our, when our faith is being challenged, when, when we're being challenged, when we're going through that hardship, when we're going through that, that adversity, it triggers our faith. And our faith goes into, into action. And as our faith goes into action, it proves, it proves whether we truly trust God or not. See, our faith, what we believe about God, what we believe that he has revealed to us through his word, when we go through adversity, when we go through challenges, when we go through the situations and the circumstances of life, those challenges, the very challenges themselves will prove to us, and here's what we've got to be honest about, they'll prove to us whether we really trust God or not. And if we really trust God, it'll trigger God's faithfulness, and we'll see God's faithfulness in our life, and we'll see this in, in just a moment. 
And, and I, notice, notice also what he, what he says. He says, if any of you needs wisdom, so if you're going through something in your life and you need wisdom, notice what he says. If you need wisdom uh, to know what you should do in the situation, then ask God and he will give it to you. God is generous to everyone and doesn't find fault with them. Let me say it this way. You and I haven't legitimately learned until we pass the test. Like think of back to our school days, elementary, middle school, high school, college. We would take tests. And if we passed that test, that proved that what the professor, what the teacher taught us, we learned. But if we failed that test, then we didn't learn what the teacher, the professor was, was teaching us. But we have to take the test to prove that, hey, I learned something. So in other words, the test for us in life, the test are the challenges, the temptations, the adversity. We need those things so that when we go through them, that we can pass that test and we can see, oh, I've learned. I've learned that God is, that God is faithful. I, I've learned that God does want to bless my life. I learned that, that God is true to his word. I've, I've learned that God is faithful. I've learned that God has forgiven me of all my sins. That the things that we read about and that we, that we trust in that is true according to his word that we're standing upon, we need the situations and the challenges of life to help reveal that it is absolutely true, that it's right. See, I mean, you could do, I mean, if, you, if you're one of those people that need to do the research to find out, man, you could do the historical research. You can find evidence of the Bible, of God, of Jesus Christ. You can find all that evidence, and that's great. But truly, truly the way that you and I are going to personally prove that God is who he says he is, is through the challenges of life and trusting his word and watching him be faithful in our lives. And not only that, not only that, but then because we pass that test, we see it ourselves. And, and, and our faith is built up, and we're built up to see that, man, God is who he says he is. Because, friends, I could tell you God, God is who he says he is till I'm blue in the face. I mean, I've experienced in my, in my life, I've experienced in, in, in my shortcomings, too, in my weaknesses, in my failures, my mistakes, God's faithfulness. But I could tell you that all day long. But until you see it and experience, remember back in week one, until you taste and see that he's good, you won't know for yourselves personally. And God wants to use the situations and the circumstances of life to prove it to you and I. Not only is he proved, but we're also proved whether we trust God or not. See, if I go through a, a tough situation, am I going to, run away from God? Am I going to say, oh, you know what? I got I to take, take matters into my own hands because God, I don't know where God is. I shouldn't be going through this bad situation if, if God was on my side. No, no, we're going to go through challenges. The way to get through those challenges is allowing our faith to be tested and, con and continuing to persevere, to undergo, because it'll trigger God's faithfulness in our lives and it'll be proven. So we'll pass that test that'll prove that we have learned the things that God wants to show us. Notice this, verse, verse 11. We consider those who endure. Notice this. Chapter 5, I'm sorry, James chapter 5, verse 11. James comes back to this topic. He says, we consider those who endure to be blessed. Why? Because they're going to experience God's faithfulness. They're going to experience life. Notice, he says, you have heard about Job's endurance. I don't know if you've ever read the story of Job in the Old Testament. You ought to read it sometime. You've heard about Job's endurance. You say that, you saw that the Lord ended Job's suffering because the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Again, if we think we've gone through challenge, challenges, hardship, man, look at Job's life. Job lost just about everything. Job lost family. He lost property. He lost, he lost his health. I mean, Job lost just about everything in his life. And here's what we find. And, and James is reminding us. He says, you know, you've heard about Job's endurance. And, and God came through in his life. And so James is saying, listen, God's going to come through in your life. And yeah, you might not be happy about it, but you can exercise true happiness simply because you know your trust is in God and he's going to come through in your life. And in fact, the very last chapter of the book of Job, I want you to notice what God does for him. Verse, or chapter 42, verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job's life more than the earlier years. More than the earlier years. See, friends, 
I know, I get it. Injustice, man, it makes us unhappy. One of the big things that make us, makes us unhappy. Challenges and, and hardships in life makes us unhappy. But still, even through those things, we can still be happy as we're walking with God. As we're, again, we got to change our thoughts. Paul says, hey, man, take control of those thoughts. Don't let that stuff rise up inside of you that you're going you're gonna to regret. That in the midst of the challenges, that we can just persevere, undergo it, allow God to give us his strength and see his faithfulness through it. That we can endure it and pass the test and prove to ourselves that we trust God and, and, and prove that God can be trusted in our lives. We can still be happy through every one of those situations. And just a conclusion or a final thought. The shrapnel from unhappiness cannot penetrate true happiness. It won't. If you and I are walking in true happiness found in God, then nothing in this life is going to penetrate it. Yeah, we'll go through unhappy stuff, but nothing in this life is going to penetrate true happiness in our lives if our trust is in God. Because God can be trusted. The question is, can we be trusted? Can we be trusted? Can we be trusted with God, what God wants to do in our lives? And he'll prove that through the situations and the challenges that we face. And you and I, just like Job, will see his faithfulness. And so the question that I want us to ask ourselves is how am I going to protect my happiness? Because there's, there's things like the injustice or like the situations and the challenges of life that are going to try to rob that happiness and even that true happiness from our lives. They're going to try to push God out of the picture and cause us to just walk in that disappointment or, or unruliness, taking revenge. So how are we going to protect it? How are we going to protect happiness? And we've talked about over these last four weeks, these last four parts. One of the ways that I would encourage you if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and I, I want to give you that opportunity this morning, today. One of the ways, or the first way actually, is turning your life over to God, surrendering your life to Him. And even if you are a Christian, but you haven't really surrendered your very life to Him, surrendering your life to Him and saying, God, here it is. I give you my life. I give you my mind. I give you my body. I give you my words, my actions. But you make that personal, just like I've got to make it personal. How are we going to protect the happiness, especially from unhappiness? How are we going to protect it? So God, I thank you so much for this word that you've shared with us today. I thank you for what you've spoken to, to our hearts, what you've invested in our lives. And God, I, I just pray that that we would allow this message, that we would allow your word, that we would allow your knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, that we would allow what you are telling us personally this morning, that we would allow it to land where it needs to land in our lives. In the launching pad, on the launching pad of our lives, wherever this message, wherever this word, what you're saying to us needs to land in our lives, God, that we would let it land right there. That we would allow you to do what you wanna do in our lives. That we would allow you to guide our lives. And God, especially in the midst of the challenges and the, and the situations, the things that we don't like, God, that we would persevere, that you would give us patience, that you would help us to persevere, you would give us your strength to persevere. God, so that we can see your faithfulness in our very lives and your faithfulness through our lives. God, we thank you that you could be trusted. We thank you, God, that you are true to your word, that just as James wrote to the group of people that were faithful, they were full of faith, that we too can be full of faith, that we too can be full of what we believe and what we trust according to your word and, and what we believe and what we trust, that you, who you are, that God, that we could stand upon that knowing that you will be faithful in our lives, that you will bring us through the situations and that just like Paul, we can say we are fully persuaded God is going to come through and he's going to cause me to overcome every situation and circumstance in my life. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' awesome and precious, mighty and great name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Yeah.
Yeah, let's give him praise.